I've been really interested in Buddhism recently because it's one of the oldest and most well-developed philosophies, not quite religions, but ways of living a good life. And it's come up in a lot of books that I've read, things that I've studied, and this book in particular, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, has come very highly recommended from a lot of different sources. Now, obviously, there are a lot of roads into exploring Buddhism and trying to understand uh, its, its ideas, its tenets, uh, and this is just one of them. But it, it's a very highly regarded one. I really, really enjoyed it. It's one of my favorite reads in a while, and it does give, I think, a very approachable overview to Buddhist philosophy and views uh, on life, especially coming from a sort of Western secular frame. Even if you aren't somebody who wants to develop a meditation practice or adopt any kind of Buddhist philosophy, I think there are a lot of ideas here that you could really resonate with uh, and benefit from. And I want to start by talking about how we look at mysticism in the West. We, we live in an era of kind of nihilistic doubt. We're very skeptical of everything. And if, if something can't be properly explained by the laws of physics and what we understand of science, then we inherently doubt it. And he says, he, he wants you to think of doubt in a different way. He says, in place of our contemporary nihilistic form of doubt, I would ask you to put what I call a noble doubt. The kind of doubt that is an integral part of the path toward enlightenment. The vast truth of the mystical teachings handed down to us is not something that our endangered world can afford to dismiss. Instead of doubting them, why don't we doubt ourselves? Our ignorance, our assumption that we understand everything already, our grasping and evasion, our passion for so-called explanations of reality that have about them nothing of the awe-inspiring and all-encompassing wisdom of what the masters, the messengers of reality have told us. It is very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that we already understand everything about the world. I think that more and more people are waking up or feeling that that's not true, right? Or that that's not a complete way of looking at the world. And there is a lot of value in studying these old ways of the masters, these old ancient kind of understandings of reality, because they might fill in some gaps that a lot of us feel are not adequately filled by modern science and technology. And you're not being unintellectual or unscientific by being open to some of these ideas. And so I, I love this idea of a noble doubt, doubting ourselves, doubting our confidence that we understand the world and being willing to say, we don't know what happens when we die, or there might not be a, an easy mathematical explanation for the beginning of the universe or consciousness or our minds, and especially for how to be happy, how to live day to day. And maybe some of these old ancient teachings can actually help us with that more than some of our more modern understandings. So with that groundwork laid, uh, I want to dive into some of the ideas in the book. And the first is, is understanding the problems of how we look at death in the West, because this is called the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, and it spends a lot of time talking about how to die well and how to help other people die well, because dying is this very integral part of life, especially in Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and if you are not prepared to die, then you cannot fully live. But the first important thing is understanding that the way we view death in the West is really hurting us, it's really setting us back. So he says that when he first came to the West, he was shocked by the contrast between the different attitudes to death. Some people are taught to deny death. He says they're taught that it means nothing but annihilation and loss. That means that most of the world lives either in denial of death or in terror of it. Even talking about death is considered morbid, and many people believe that simply mentioning death is to risk wishing it upon ourselves. Then he says that the other common view is to look on death with a naive, thoughtless cheerfulness thinking that for some unknown reason, death will work out all right for them and that it is nothing to worry about. He says that when he thinks of them, he's reminded of what Tibetan master says. People often make the mistake of being frivolous about death and think, oh, well, death happens to everybody. It's not a big deal. It's natural. I'll be fine. That's a nice theory until one is dying. So what he says then is that of these two attitudes towards death, one views death as something to scurry away from and the other as something that will just take care of itself how far they both are from understanding death's true significance. And I should mention that part of how I found this book was it was mentioned in The Comfort Crisis by Michael Easter, and he said that uh, this book and this philosophy on death uh, is actually very instrumental to some of the happiest people in the world. And, and this is something that um, Rinpoche talks about a lot, that by developing a healthy relationship with death, then these two attitudes, attitudes that 
most people in the West, especially, uh, probably hold towards death, right? Either that it's something scary, I don't want to think about it, or that it's fine, I'm you know, like, whatever, everybody dies, right? I'm not going to care, I'll be dead. <laughs> uh, getting away from those two attitudes can help a lot with living a happier life. So he goes on to talk about this idea of life after death, and he gives a very compelling argument for the utility of entertaining or believing some form of life after death. All the greatest spiritual traditions of the world, including, of course, Christianity, have told us clearly that death is not the end. They have all handed down a vision of some sort of life to come, which infuses this life that we are leading now with sacred meaning. But despite their teachings, modern society is largely a spiritual desert, where the majority imagine that this life is all that there is. Without any real or authentic faith in an afterlife, most people live lives deprived of any ultimate meaning. The disastrous effects of the denial of death go far beyond the individual. They affect the whole planet. Believing fundamentally that this life is the only one, modern people have developed no long-term vision. How often have you thought about that or felt that way? That our governments or our leaders don't seem to care about the future, whichever uh, topic you index on, if that's climate change or if that's human rights or if that's uh, technology, many of us have had this feeling that, oh, the people in power don't care about the future. They are just milking the earth for themselves. And uh, Rinpoche makes this really compelling argument that there is a great reason to believe in some form of afterlife, rebirth, uh, a future uh, after death, because if you don't believe in that, then it's harder to have the same kind of compassion for the future. Obviously, having children helps that a lot, but we are on some level, like, somewhat selfish in this way, right? Uh, and imagining that there will be some life to come that we need to be prepared for does help for taking uh, the future of the world more seriously. He says that our society is obsessed with youth, sex, and power, and we shun old age and decay. Isn't it terrifying that we discard old people when their working life is finished and they are no longer useful? Isn't it disturbing that we cast them into old people's homes where they die lonely and abandoned? And he's making a compelling case here that this is a very unhealthy, escapist attitude towards death. It's probably one of the most significant events of our lives, and we try to hide from it, pretend that it isn't happening, to the extent that we hide the old people away from the rest of society, because it makes us uncomfortable to look at them and to think that one day we will be old and dying too. And so if we want to have a healthy relationship with our own life and with our own death, we need to be willing to confront the, the reality of death around us every day. And so because of this fear of death, this escaping, being able to confront our mortality, we don't know ourselves very well. And if you're picking up hints of Denial of Death by Ernest Becker, there's a lot of overlap here, which I really love because that's a very psychology, a little bit of religion, more scientific, analytically driven book. This is obviously drawing on thousands of years of Buddhist tradition, and they're saying very similar things. So Soyal says, perhaps the deepest reason why we are afraid of death is because we do not know who we are. We believe in a personal, unique, and separate identity. But if we dare to examine it, we find that this identity depends entirely on an endless collection of things to prop it up. Our name, our biography, our partners, family, home, job, friends, credit cards. It is on their fragile and transient support that we rely for our security. So when they are all taken away, will we have any idea who we really are? Without our familiar props, we are faced with just ourselves, a person we do not know, an unnerving stranger with whom we have been living all the time, but we never really wanted to meet. Isn't that why we have tried to fill every moment of time with noise and activity, however boring or trivial, to ensure that we are never left in silence with this stranger on our own? Now, this passage really hit me because it's saying two very powerful things. One is that most of us have a self-identity, a personal identity, built up on things external to us. It's our titles in society. It's how our peers view us. It is what we have accomplished. It is not grounded in the, the reality of our mind, of who we are when all of that is stripped away. And if your identity relies on all of these external things, if you look outside yourself to understand yourself, then the fear of losing those things is immense, right? If you lose your job, if you lose your partner, if you lose your YouTube subscribers, <laughs> who are you, right? Like how much of your identity has been taken away from you? 
And what he brings up later is that when you die, all of that stuff gets stripped away, especially as you're approaching death. People might not want to be around you because death makes them uncomfortable. You may have lost other friends. You may no longer be doing your job. These things that you have uh, pegged your identity to are stripped away and all that's left is you. And that is a very terrifying position to be in if it is not a position that you are comfortable with embracing. And so how long can you sit in isolation with no stimulus, with none of these external sources of validation around you and really explore yourself and who you are? And can you like that person? Can you love that person? That's a remarkably scary thing, I think, to entertain if we're very honest with ourselves because we get so few opportunities to do it. And because we're constantly inundating ourselves with noise and distraction and ways to pull us away from sitting quietly and getting to know that person. And so most of us don't really know ourselves. And this manifests in a way that he describes as Western laziness. Naturally, there are different species of laziness, Eastern and Western. The Eastern style is like the one practiced to perfection in India. It consists of hanging out all day in the sun, doing nothing, avoiding any kind of work or useful activity, drinking cups of tea, listening to Hindi film music, blaring on the radio, and gossiping with friends. And if most of us in the West were asked to define laziness or describe laziness, that is probably the kind of behavior we would describe. But Soigal goes on to, dis to talk about the Western laziness that we practice. He says, Western laziness is quite different. It consists of cramming our lives with compulsive activity so that there is no time at all to confront the real issues. If we look into our lives, we will see clearly how many unimportant tasks, so-called responsibilities, accumulate to fill them up. One master compares them to housekeeping in a dream. We tell ourselves we want to spend time on the important things of life, but there never is any time. Even simply to get up in the morning, there is so much to do. Open the window, make the bed, take a shower, brush your teeth, feed the dog or cat. Do last night's washing up, discover you are out of sugar or coffee, go and buy them, make breakfast. The list is endless. Then there are clothes to sort out, choose, iron, and fold up again. And what about your hair or your makeup? Helpless, we watch our days fill up with telephone calls and petty projects, with so many responsibilities, or shouldn't we call them irresponsibilities? Our lives seem to live us, to possess their own bizarre momentum, to carry us away, in the end, we feel we have no choice or control over them. Of course we feel bad about this sometimes. We have nightmares and wake up in a sweat wondering, what am I doing with my life? But our fears only last until breakfast time. Out comes the briefcase and back we go to where we started. This just describes so many of us to a T, doesn't it? We have these moments, these moments of clarity where we go, oh my gosh, what am I spending all this time doing? What am I working on? Where is all this time of my day going? And then we, we start to make a plan. We say, I'm gonna cut back on all these responsibilities, all these things that don't matter. I don't need to spend money on, on this thing. I don't need to spend time with this person or on this project. None of those things matter. And then a day goes by or a few days go by and the responsibilities start to creep back in. And we have to recognize that part of us craves those distractions. We call it work, we call it busyness, we call it productivity, we call it working on ourselves, all of these things. But the reality is, most of them are distractions to pull us away from looking at ourselves, from developing comfort with ourselves, comfort with inaction, comfort with that personal self that exists when stripped away from all these external sources of validation. And so this is the Western laziness, filling our days with compulsive activity so that we can't deal with these harder questions about our life and meaning. But that doesn't mean that we have to run off to a monastery and spend all of our time meditating. There's a way to take life seriously while still living in modern society. He says, taking life seriously does not spending our whole lives meditating as if we were living in the mountains. In the modern world, we have to work and earn our living, but we should not get entangled in a nine to five existence where we live without any view of the deeper meaning of life. Our task is to strike a balance, to find a middle way to learn not to overstretch ourselves with extraneous activities and preoccupations, but to simplify our lives more and more. The key to finding a happy balance in modern life is simplicity. So this is what we should be striving for, not to spend all day meditating, but to simplify, 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 reduce those things that are pulling our attention away from that deeper self and be very honest with what actually matters to spend time on and what is merely a distraction. And one of those big sources of distractions or why we chase all this distraction is that we have a deep discomfort with impermanence with change, with things being out of our control. He says, one of the chief reasons we have so much anguish and difficulty facing death is that we ignore the truth of impermanence. 
We so desperately want everything to continue as it is that we have to believe that things will always stay the same. But this is only make-believe. This is a point that he talks about a lot, that life is always changing, the world is always changing, and the more we cling to things staying the way they are, the more we will feel uh, out of control in our lives. There's a good analogy of sticking your hand into a river and trying to grab the water and stop the river. Obviously, that's ridiculous, but that is what so much of us, or so many of us are trying to do with our lives. We are trying to grab the water and stop the river. We're trying to exert control over the flow of life when so much of life is just completely outside of our control. We have to be willing to surrender to that flow of life in a certain sense and be okay with things constantly changing, uh, with the world being unpredictable, and with knowing that we can't really predict or have that much influence on how things are going to go in the future. We have to be okay with things happening largely outside of our control. There is only one law in the universe that never changes, that all things change and that all things are impermanent. And if we want to be able to be at least calm or be able to moderate the many crazy stresses, surprises, challenges that life throws at us, we have to very deeply accept this idea of impermanence and change. But it's extremely hard, especially for a neurotic type A checklist type person to accept that because then you have to admit that a certain amount of your striving is wasted, that all of this energy you're putting into controlling the world around you is only making you more anxious and more stressed. And letting go is extremely hard for that type of person, which again comes back to this deep discomfort with death and this desire to kind of like distract ourselves from the reality of our lives. Now, the way you develop a comfort with the impermanent nature of the world, the way you escape some of this Western laziness and, and become more comfortable with yourself, with being removed from all these external sources of your identity, of validation, and actually develop that healthier, calmer relationship with life is by, as he describes it, becoming a Buddha. Now, this was a, a big surprise for me as I read this book. I, I always had this, I guess, more deified understanding of Buddha or the Buddha. I always thought of them as uh, you know, something a little bit more like a prophet, right? Like Muhammad or Jesus or um, you know, a, a like semi-godlike figure. So he all explains that that's not the case. He says, it's important to remember that Buddha was a human being like you or me. He never claimed divinity. He merely knew he had the Buddha nature, the seed of enlightenment, and that everyone else did too. The Buddha nature is simply the birthright of every sentient being, and I always say our Buddha nature is as good as any Buddha's nature. This is the good news that the Buddha brought us from his enlightenment, and which many people find so inspiring. His message that enlightenment is within the reach of all holds out tremendous hope. Through practice, we too can all become awakened. If this were not true, countless individuals down to the present day would not have become enlightened. Now, this is really powerful because it's, it's not saying that you need to perform a certain way in this life to be rewarded in the next. It's not saying that you should worship some god to receive their blessing or their divinity. It's that you have this enlightened nature inside of you. You have this Buddha nature within you. And it is something that we can all tap into, that we can achieve, that we can reach this uh, feeling of enlightenment merely through practice. And that is extremely empowering. You're just respecting that this person put in the work and committed themselves to uh, developing this deep comfort with themselves through the practice. And through that, they achieved this enlightenment, right? This, this way of being in the world that is free or freer of many of the sources of stress and suffering that we're all encumbered by uh, every day and the, the ones that we try to distract ourselves from. And I, I found that really, really inspiring. It was the most compelling case I'd read for developing any kind of like spirituality practice. So this isn't some otherworldly supernatural thing. This is a way of being that we can all tap into through sufficient practice. And he ties in ideas from other religions in a very compelling way too. He says, saints and mystics throughout history have adorned their realizations with different names and given them different faces and interpretations. But what they are all fundamentally experiencing is, ex is the essential nature of the mind. Christians and Jews call it God. Hindus call it the self, Shiva, Brahman, and Vishnu. Sufi mystics name it the hidden essence and Buddhists call it Buddha nature. At the heart of all religions is the certainty that there is a fundamental truth 
and that this life is a sacred opportunity to evolve and realize it. And that's really kind of a beautiful goal, that the, the sacred opportunity of life is to evolve and realize what this essential truth is. And he's making the case that it is this Buddha nature that lives within us, this deep acceptance of the impermanence of life. And I love what he says a little bit later on this topic too about our relationship with ourself because it ties in to some of these ideas here. He says that the Dalai Lama talks often of the lack of real self-love and self-respect that he sees in many people in the modern world. Underlying our whole outlook is a neurotic conviction of our own limitations. This denies us all hope of awakening and tragically contradicts the central truth of Buddha's teaching that we are all already essentially perfect. Now, this is again kind of a, this, this like bipolar idea around our, our nature, right? You can believe that we are all fundamentally broken, sinners, bad, and we need to be like saved from ourselves. Or you can believe that we are all fundamentally perfect and we need to rediscover that deeper perfect nature within each of us. And the Buddhism is, is arguing the latter, at least as Sogyal is describing Buddhism in the Tibetan tradition, it is arguing the latter. And that's really quite beautiful, right? That, that fundamentally we each have this enlightened Buddha nature within us. And it is something that we need to merely tap into through continued practice like meditation uh, and studying. And if I had to choose an outlook on life, I would prefer to think that uh, we are all good enough. We are all, you know, deep down perfect and we just have to strip away the things that are getting in the way of that uh, imperfection rather than believe that we're fundamentally broken or bad creatures who need to be like saved or fixed by some uh, force outside of ourselves. And he goes on to explain the kind of unintuitive subtlety in what it means to like become a Buddha or realize Buddha nature. He says, spiritual truth is not something elaborate and esoteric. It is in fact profound common sense. When you realize the nature of mind, layers of confusion peel away. You don't actually become a Buddha. You simply cease slowly to be deluded. And being a Buddha is not being some omnipotent spiritual superhuman, but becoming at last a true human being. And what a, what a beautiful way to describe that goal. Your goal isn't to become perfect or a god, it's to become a true human being. Uh, and that's something that you can work basically your entire life on getting closer and closer to. Now the core practice for us to discover our Buddha, Buddha nature is through meditation. And he says that what the Buddha saw was that ignorance of our true nature is the root of all the torment of samsara. And the root of ignorance itself is our mind's habitual tendency to distraction. Samsara is a term of sort of like the daily suffering and struggle that happens as in existence as humans. So the ignorance of our true nature is the root of all of that suffering that we experience. And the root of ignorance itself is our habitual tendency towards distraction. So by getting constantly distracted, we are ignorant of our true nature. And by being ignorant of our true nature, we experience all of this suffering in our lives. Very powerful way to think about it. Uh, and he says, to end the mind's distraction would be to end samsara itself. The key to this, he realized, is to bring the mind home to its true nature through the practice of meditation. And I love this idea that meditation is bringing the mind home. It's rediscovering the mind's true nature. It's not making you more productive. It's not blocking out distractions. It's not increasing your focus. It is helping your mind discover its true nature. It is bringing it home to where it is actually the most comfortable. And I also saw it described recently that meditation is actually learning how to relax. You're learning how to actually be comfortable with yourself, actually settle down, actually let the noise fade away. You're not silencing things. It's not an aggressive, sharp action. It is a calm letting go of all of these distractions and stressors in your life, right? You're, you're letting the mind come home to rest. But how do you do that? <laughs> and there are a ton of different ways to present meditation and each Buddhist practice presents it differently. But he says that the purpose of meditation is to awaken in us the sky-like nature of mind and to introduce us to that which we really are, our unchanging pure awareness, which underlies the whole of life and death. In the stillness and silence of meditation, we glimpse and return to that deep inner nature that we have so long ago lost sight of amid the busyness and distraction of our minds. 
Isn't it extraordinary that our minds cannot stay still for longer than a few moments without grasping after distraction? They are so restless and preoccupied that sometimes I think that living in a city in the modern world, we are already like the tormented beings in the intermediate state after death, where the consciousness is said to uh, be agonizingly restless. Up to 13% of people in the United States suffer from some kind of mental disorder. What does that say about the way we live? Talking more about distraction, he says that we are fragmented into so many different aspects we don't know who we really are or what aspects of ourselves we should identify with or believe in. So many contradictory voices, dictates, and feelings fight for control over our inner lives that we find ourselves scattered everywhere in all directions, leaving nobody at home. Meditation, then, is bringing the mind home. And then he spends a good amount of time talking about the different ways you can meditate. He talks about zazen, sitting meditation. He talks about uh, like idle meditation, so you're focusing on a, a, an image as kind of the, the source of, of focus for your meditation. He also talks about mantra meditations, chanting, and how that can help. And there are really endless resources on this, and you probably just want to try a few and find the one that resonates the best with you. I've really enjoyed Sam Harris's Waking Up app. That's been very helpful for getting into it. Headspace, obviously, also fantastic. There are, are also actually some really great Tibetan Buddhist chanting meditations on Spotify. But in this section, he talks about uh, a few points of meditation that I found really helpful because they weren't brought up in any of these apps or other resources. So one thing that he talks about is that in his tradition of meditation, your eyes should be kept open. He says that in my tradition of meditation, your eyes should be kept open. And this is a very important point. Uh, once your mind is calm and the clarity of insights begins to arise, you should feel free to bring your gaze up, opening your eyes more and looking into the space directly in front of you. He says, kind of like, start by looking down at a 45 degree angle, eyes half closed. And as you settle into meditation, you kind of look up and fade out into the space in front of you. It, there's, there's a distinct feeling that you'll get if you try this and practice it. And the point he makes here that I think is really compelling is that if you always meditate with your eyes closed, then it's very hard to bring that meditation practice into daily life because our, our visual sense is probably our strongest, right? It's always overwhelming with this information. And so if you are not practiced bringing the mind home while being assaulted by all of this stimulation in your visual field, then it will be very difficult to bring that practice into the real world. And it's because that practice is so different from the reality of existence that they are hard to integrate with one another. The other thing he mentions in here about meditation uh, that surprised me is about how long to meditate. And he actually says that you don't necessarily want to aim for 20 minutes or 15 minutes. There's nothing special about those amounts of time. What's more important is actually practicing going out of the meditative state and coming into it. So he talks about sitting for a short time. He doesn't say exactly how long, but I'm thinking he might mean five or 10 minutes and then taking a very short break of about 30 seconds to a minute and then going back in. Because again, the point is to train your mind to come home and relax. And obviously you're doing that while you are meditating and while you're continually bringing your attention back to your breath or your chanting. But if you allow yourself to come out of meditation and then go back into it, you'll actually deepen your ability to quickly settle into that state in other situations as well, especially if you're also meditating with your eyes open. So I found that incorporating both of those into my meditation practice in other contexts has been very, very helpful for incorporating more of it into my daily life. And that, that's really what he describes. He says, gradually through this interplay of breaks and sitting, the barrier between meditation and everyday life will crumble. The contrast between them will dissolve and you will find yourself increasingly in your natural, pure presence without distraction. Then even though the meditator may leave the meditation, the meditation will not leave the meditator. And then the last really powerful thing on how to meditate that, again, this was super useful to me and I wish it had been touched on more in the other apps and tools, is that he, he says, I always tell my students not to come out of meditation too quickly. Allow a period of some minutes for the piece of the practice of meditation to infiltrate your life. If your meditation timer goes off and you immediately grab your phone, turn it off and whisk back to work, you're probably not getting much out of the meditation. You need to give yourself a few minutes to slowly ease back into normal life, to let the benefits kind of like integrate themselves and to not allow yourself to immediately become reactive again. So if you would normally set aside 20 minutes to meditate, maybe set aside 25, 26, 30, so that you have a few minutes at the beginning to settle in before you start. And then you have a few minutes at the end to settle out, maybe even stretching a bit, closing your eyes, 
doing a little mantra, something to bring yourself back into normal life before immediately just like rushing off to the next thing. Again, you want to blur the lines between meditation and daily life as much as possible so that, as he said, and I love this line, even though the meditator may leave the meditation, the meditation does not leave the meditator. Now, moving on from meditation, another core concept he talks about is karma. And this is one that, again, I came into this with a sort of woo interpretation of karma, right? What you do in this life will affect you in the next, or something of, of that nature. But he gives, again, a very compelling secular friendly uh, understanding of karma. Karma is often totally misunderstood in the West as fate or predestination. It is best thought of as the infallible law of cause and effect that governs the universe. The word karma literally means action, and karma is both the power latent within actions and the results our actions bring. In simple terms, what does karma mean? It means that whatever we do with our body, speech, or mind, it will have a corresponding result. Each action, even the smallest, is pregnant with its consequences. It is said by the masters that even a little poison can cause death and even a tiny seed can become a huge tree. And as Buddha said, do not overlook negative actions merely because they are small. However small a spark may be, it can burn down a haystack as big as a mountain. So he says that although the result of our actions may not have matured yet, they will inevitably ripen, giving the right conditions. So if you do good things, good things will happen at some point in the future as a result of those actions. If you're doing bad things, bad things will happen in the future at some point because of those actions, cause and effect. And sometimes it might take a very long time for uh, the outcome of those decisions to be realized. You can get away with things for a long time, so to speak. And this is one of those ideas that even if it might not necessarily be true, right? Obviously, well, no, I'm not gonna say obviously. <laughs> I, it, it's tempting to say that people don't always get what they deserve for better or worse, but it is a useful, way to look at the world and operate, at least for your own actions. I think it could be harmful psychologically if you always expect good things to happen to you for doing good things, in the same way that you might be upset if bad things don't happen to bad people. But if you are deciding how to act, it's probably best to act under this assumption of karma. If you do good things, good things will happen. If you do bad things, bad things will happen. And that is just a simple way to look at making decisions and acting in life, right? Cause and effect. And he actually encourages you to look at your own life this way. He says, if we examine our actions and become really mindful of them, we will see that there is a pattern that repeats itself in our actions. Whenever we act negatively, it leads to pain and suffering. Whenever we act positively, it eventually results in happiness. And if you take the time to sort of analyze uh, decisions you've made or ways that you act in your life, I think you will see and you, you will start to identify that there are certain recurring ways that we act negatively that ends up making us feel worse. And there are ways we act positively or helpfully that end up bringing a lot of happiness into our lives. And so going forward, we can say that we should try to do more of those good actions in our life and it will bring more happiness in the world around us. Again, it almost seems slightly trite to put it that way, but it, it is a very powerful outlook on life. And again, a much simpler, straightforward, digestible idea of karma than the more like woo future life uh, type definition most of us might have heard before. So let's say that you've been listening to some other things about Buddhism as well. Maybe you're considering picking up this book or some other books. How do you actually try to follow this path? How do you try to develop your Buddha nature. Obviously, the meditation practice is really important. The realizing karma is really important, realizing distraction and how we pull ourselves away from our nature. All of that is very important, but he gives some guidance on how to actually follow the path uh, as well that I, that I found really compelling. The first thing that he talks about is that the most important thing is not to be trapped in what I see everywhere in the West, a shopping mentality, shopping around from master to master, teaching to teaching without any continuity or real sustained dedication to any one discipline. Nearly all the great spiritual masters of all traditions agree that the essential thing is to master one way, one path to the truth by following one tradition with all your heart and mind to the end of the spiritual journey while remaining open and respectful toward the insights of all others. In Tibet, we used to say, knowing one, you accomplish all. 
the modern faddish idea that we can always keep all our options open and so never need to commit ourselves to anything is one of the greatest and most dangerous delusions of our culture and one of Eco's most effective ways of sabotaging our spiritual search. And here I think is the most powerful part of this argument. He says, when you go on searching all of the time, the searching itself becomes an obsession and takes you over. You become a spiritual tourist, bustling about and never getting anywhere. Following one teaching is not a way of confining you or jealously monopolizing you. It is a compassionate and skillful way of keeping you centered and always on the path, despite all of the obstacles that you and the world will inevitably present. So if you decide to you know, look into this or pursue it, it does help, at least according to his argument, to kind of like pick one practice and just fully focus on it. And the thing that he talks about in here too is that a lot of these ideas, a lot of these practices, a lot of these guidance, it's all, it's very old <laughs> and it's very well recorded, right? We have hundreds and thousands of years of guidance and lessons. And a lot of it is actually, it's not simple to practice. It's not simple to realize, but the, the lessons are, uh, there's not a, an insane library of material you have to get through. And so a lot of these much more modern Western contortions of Eastern spirituality and mysticism are not necessary. And they're, they're often distractions and they're ways of these like modern gurus trying to uh, trap you or get you into their own much more complicated versions of these that often involve paying for expensive courses or doing expensive tests and seminars and things like that, right? Like you don't want to be distracted by these overcomplications of these ancient ideas. And so you can go to these much older texts and find these ideas and have a direct relationship with them. You can find a local Buddhist center or something like that uh, to receive the information more directly than through these more modern, confused <clears throat> reinterpretations of it. And the last part of this that is so important uh, for trying to follow this path is recognizing that you need it <laughs> or that you want to, to follow it, that you need some help getting out of this constant chatter, this constant distraction, this, this monkey mind. The turning point in any healing of alcoholics or drug addicts is when they admit their illness and ask for aid. In one way or another, we are all addicts of samsara. The moment when we, in one way or another, we are all addicts of samsara. The moment when help can come for us is when we admit our addiction and simply ask. So if you see yourself in any of these descriptions, this, uh, these challenges with distraction, with getting to know ourselves, with Western laziness, this desire to meditate and bring the mind home and, and develop this kind of a practice, then uh, you have to ask for help or you have to seek it out. Uh, and this book is a really fantastic place to start. I mean, there's so much in here that I didn't get to. All these wonderful other forms of meditation, all the material on being comfortable with death and helping the dying. It's, it's really it, one of my favorite books I've read in a while. So I, I highly encourage you to check it out if Buddhism is at all interesting to you. Aside from that, if you are enjoying these uh, book summaries, please tell a friend. It is the best way to support what I'm doing here. Uh, like and subscribe, leave a review wherever uh, is the next best way. And I'll see you next time for uh, another great book.